Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, a biotech company has claimed they've brought the dire wolf back from extinction, a new species of dinosaur has been discovered in China, bonobo calls have been discovered to have features similar to human languages, and much, much more. For our top story this week, let's focus on the recent claim made by US biotech company Colossal Biosciences, stating that they have brought the dire wolf back from extinction. Colossal announced that they have produced three wolf pups, two males named Romulus and Remus, and a female named Khaleesi, using domestic dogs as surrogate mothers to give birth to them. It's claimed these wolves will grow to about six feet long and could weigh 150 pounds, and they've been engineered to have fluffy white coats as well as larger skulls. So the company has claimed that they have revived the dire wolf after it went extinct some 10,000 years ago. The thing is, that's just not true. What Colossal has really done here is edit several genes in a living grey wolf to make them have some features that appear comparable to what we think a dire wolf might have been like. Contrary to what the headlines imply, no actual dire wolf DNA was inserted into the grey wolf genomes. They just edited what was already there in the grey wolves to produce the desired physical features. In total, they made 20 changes in 14 genes. As many people have pointed out already, there are numerous issues with the claims being made here. First of all, the dire wolf is not even in the same genus as a modern grey wolf. Recent genetic studies have shown that dire wolves were highly divergent from all other living dogs, splitting off from them some 5.7 million years ago. So that's a considerable divergence time, meaning grey wolves are very distantly related. Therefore, claiming that an edited modern grey wolf can be classified as a dire wolf is just plain wrong. Colossal argues they are going by the phenotypic definition of a species when they call them dire wolves, that is, classifying them as such based on their physical characteristics. But again, when these organisms are so genetically different to begin with, that's a very misleading and unscientific way of classifying a species. As one geneticist has said, this is not a dire wolf under any definition of a species ever. The chosen coat, coloration of the wolves being very pale, is also based on currently unreviewed genetic research by Colossal. The company has stated that a paper detailing all their findings will be published soon, so it'll be interesting to see that. But really, the paper should have been released before or alongside all this media hype. And it really does seem that they chose this coloration to match the pop culture view of dire wolves, as made famous by Game of Thrones. I mean, the name of the female wolf and the photo shoot they did with the pups on the Iron Throne makes it pretty clear this is mostly about getting media attention. Colossal was also in the news last month when they announced that they'd created woolly mice as part of their efforts to resurrect the woolly mammoth. But this was a similarly misleading announcement. What they'd really done was edit several genes at once in mice to create a shaggy-haired breed of these rodents, and no actual mammoth DNA was involved. The technology is still interesting, and at least a paper accompanied this announcement, but it seems to be another example of Colossal deliberately miseducating the public, which seems to be the standard for them. And there's a more serious issue underlying all this too as the continued misleading headlines push forward a narrative that extinction isn't forever, and that it's okay to not worry about species dying out as we can always bring them back eventually. This is of course not the case, and could present an obstacle to future conservation efforts if the general public keeps being made to think that we can bring back extinct animals exactly the way they were, when in reality they are entirely different organisms with some edited genes. Colossal is indeed also working on cloning endangered animals to help broaden their gene pools, and the Dire Wolf articles mention their work with cloning hybrid individuals that have genes from the endangered red wolf. This certainly seems to be a much more worthwhile effort compared to making some edited grey wolves, but in most articles on the subject, it's largely buried by the dire wolf story. So, in summary, no, these are absolutely not dire wolves, and claiming that they are is entirely unscientific. There's some pretty blatant deception going on here, 
and it's disappointing to see, but not really surprising anymore given the company's history. The underlying gene editing technology is of course still interesting and really could have some fantastic applications when it comes to preserving modern species that are at risk of dying out. But I really wish they'd be far more transparent about the reality of what they're doing when it comes to making these genetically edited modern organisms. Dire wolves are still long extinct and we won't be seeing them alive again for a long while yet. Also in the news this week, we welcome a new species of dinosaur. It's called Yuan Moraptor Jing Shajiangensis. And it was uncovered in approximately 170 million year old Middle Jurassic rocks in southwestern China. This is a new kind of meat-eating theropod dinosaur and is part of the family Metriacanthosauridae. It's known from a fossilized skull that looks like a bit of a mess, but it actually preserves a good deal of the bones. Plus, 11 vertebrae were discovered too. Metriacanthosaurids are an interesting group of dinosaurs that still have an uncertain relationship to other lineages of carnivorous dinosaurs. And a poor fossil record of these dinosaurs during the mid-Jurassic makes it more difficult to work out how they evolved. Yuan Morapta is therefore particularly significant as it dates to this point in time. And the paleontologists also find that this new species is the earliest diverging member of the Metriacanthosaurids that we've found so far. So an important new dinosaur discovery that should provide lots of insight into the evolution of these reptiles. Up next in the paleontology news is some particularly interesting new research, which has found strong supporting evidence for Triceratops having evolved anagenetically. Anagenesis is a type of evolutionary change in which a lineage gradually changes over time, resulting in one species essentially transforming into another. This is in contrast to cladogenesis, in which one lineage is divided in some way, and two or more distinct lineages descend from this single ancestral species. Currently, two species of the famous horned dinosaur Triceratops are recognised, the older Triceratops horridus and the slightly younger Triceratops prorsus. And paleontologists have previously hypothesised that they evolved anagenetically, with Horridus turning into Prorsus over time. This idea was based on studies of the Hell Creek formation of Montana, with scientists noticing that Prorsus only occurred in the younger rock layers here, while Horridus was found only in the older ones. Well, in this new research, paleontologists have looked at rocks found in Canada to test this hypothesis. The rock layers they looked at here are roughly equal to the upper third of the Hell Creek formation, where only Triceratops Prorsus is found. So if Triceratops evolved anagenetically, then they would expect to only find Prorsus in Canada. Well, this exhaustive survey of Canadian Triceratops fossil material did indeed only turn up Prorsus bones, meaning the anagenetic hypothesis is quite strongly supported. The researchers say that we still need to examine Triceratops fossils from further south, such as those found in Colorado, to see if this trend continues in other locations. But it's a particularly fascinating discovery, showing that dinosaurs can sometimes be used to study evolutionary models over large spans of deep time. In other news, scientists have discovered that communication in wild bonobos shows features that were previously thought to be unique to human languages. Hello, this is Ben here, and I'm just cutting in quickly to say that we had some audio issues while filming this next bit and it didn't actually record, so I'm just going to give a voiceover. Here goes. A key feature of human language is a pattern known as compositionality, which is when two elements are combined to form a larger meaningful structure. This compositionality has two different forms, trivial and non-trivial. Trivial is when each element contributes to the greater meaning independently of the other element. So the example given in the paper is the phrase blonde dancer. This means the person is both blonde and a dancer. Okay, and back to Amelia. On the other hand, the non-trivial form is when the individual elements combine, so that one part modifies the meaning of the other. The phrase bad dancer would be an example of this. Bad dancer. This isn't a bad person who is also a dancer, they are just bad at dancing. So the word bad modifies the meaning of the whole phrase. Previous research has discovered some evidence of compositionality in birds and primates, However, the non-trivial form has not been documented. That is, until now. This new research analysed 700 recordings of bonobo calls and revealed that each of their call types 
occurs in at least one kind of combination. And three of those combinations were also non-trivial. So bonobos have much stronger parallels with human language than previously thought. And compositionality might even be a trait that evolved in the common ancestor of both our lineages, which would have lived more than seven million years ago. Finally for the news this week, a new way of making concrete has been discovered. The making of concrete, the world's most widely used synthetic material, causes a huge amount of environmental damage, as it needs vast quantities of sand, much of which comes from dredging riverbeds and from quarries. Limestone is also needed to make concrete, and when it is heated to form a material called clinker, calcium oxide and CO2 are produced releasing huge quantities of this greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. But now researchers at Northwestern University have developed a way to produce concrete in an environmentally friendly way, by making a paste that can be used to make concrete mixes that don't need sand and amazingly captures carbon. The paste-like substance of calcium carbonate and magnesium hydroxide is made using seawater, carbon dioxide and electricity. The researchers modelled it on the method by which corals and shellfish build their skeletons. By adjusting variables like voltage, flow rate and reaction time, they can produce different shapes, sizes and porosities making them suitable for making plasters or even paints. This new concrete meets the same industry standards that traditional concrete does and has already been used in some commercial building projects. It is hoped this new material will revolutionise the construction industry, bringing huge benefits to the environment. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. You can follow Seven Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Batha, who is new, Drev Strivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotis, John French, Joseph Ree, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Piafazika Jr., Robert Thomas, who I think is new as well, Sammy Voss Schlom, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Ted Rowe, and Troy Schmitz. <laughs> or Troy, Sh Troy Schmidt. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next week.